Hi, everyone. Welcome back to section. Um, lovely day out, which is why I'm sure there are only four of you here and not our usual pack. I have been sick this weekend, so I don't have Starburst for you guys, and I may start coughing terribly throughout this, so just bear with me. I'm going to really try and like get through this first, though, before I have a coughing attack. Um, but just be easy on me a little bit. That's all I ask. Um, <coughs> so our agenda for today, just a reminder, your quiz is next week. I told you this last week, so it wouldn't catch you off guard. So I'm reminding you again, next week's your quiz. To that end, next week's section will be much more of like, I'll try and work in some review. So if you guys could help me out by sending me things that you're uncomfortable with, that you're worried about, topics that you'd like for me to cover, that'd be great so that I can try and work them into our section next week or send you extra material or prep that you might not get elsewhere. Yay, more people are coming. I, was, I thought you all like, like, did I do that badly last week that no one wants to come back? I'm scared. Um, so the other three things that we're going to go over are redirection, file I.O., and then pointers and dynamic memory. I'm sure you're all super excited about pointers. It's everyone's favorite topic. It's like so simple to understand. I'm sure you guys all got that, right? So first things first, redirection. So. This is basically just a way to kind of control how you input things into your program, how you output things from your program. The main way that you guys have been interacting with it is just through um, <clears throat> standard out, which is your print screen here. But there are ways to pipe, as we've seen here, it's one more of our words, um, kind of pipe that information or that data into a file, from a file. It's just different ways of getting things into your program and out of your program instead of just printing them from the printing them to the screen or inputting things from the command line. So first one is a little greater than caret. So output. It just prints the output to a file instead of your screen. Um, so if you had something that printed hello world uh, to the screen, if you put it instead to output.txt, that creates this file called output.txt. And when you open it, it'll say hello world in there. Um, this can be super useful if you have a ton of errors, actually, as we see in this one. If you do two caret, it'll print the error messages. So if you're having you know, a problem with compiling, it has a lot of errors, and you're getting bogged down in trying to scroll through in your command line through all of them, you can just print them to a file, open up that file so that you can scroll through them easier. I actually use that a lot when I was debugging um, my 181 P sets for machine learning. So it can be super useful later on. It's also useful if you have, um, <clears throat> if you have a program that maybe is generating a library or generating some set of strings and you need to be able to see that it's generating them properly. This is a way to do that. So if you print them to a file, you can more easily examine them, right? Versus trying to scroll through your command line. And then one thing to know is that with just the greater than caret, if you are writing to a file that already exists, so like if we ran this the first time, um, and we put it to output.txt, and then we had a second program that printed, this is program two, and did a greater than to output.txt, it will overwrite that. It will overwrite what was ever in that file to begin with. Okay. So if you want to append to a file, as we see here, you just do two caret to rec, to greater than sign. And it will append to it. It won't overwrite it. So if you need to run multiple programs and kind of keep track of what all of them are returning to you in a file, that's the way to do it. If you don't care what's in your file and it's allowed to be overwritten, you can just use a single greater than. Does that make sense to everyone? So that, mm -hmm. So if you do like dot slash hello um, greater than output dot text mm -hmm. like twice, It'll just only show on output.txt the second right. time. Right, so it would only show the second time. It would basically um, just completely overwrite what was there to begin with. If this file here, the output.txt, already exists, basically, it, whenever you call that again with a single greater than, you can just think of it as like creating, like it replaces a file. Like when you're saving a Word document and you do save as and you keep the same name and it completely overwrites it, this is the same sort of thing. Anyone have any questions on just outputting to a file? Cool? Awesome. So obviously, if you reverse the uh, arrow direction, it can do input. 
So with um, when you guys had like Caesar or uh, Visioneer and you had to input something, you had a command line argument that actually input it, this is another way uh, to do that. So instead of waiting for like a command prompt, like when you asked for your message in Caesar or Visioneer, if you had a text file that had your message, you could just type it into that. So if this were like dot slash Caesar three um, less than arrow input text, which is your message, that would run just fine. Um, it would, when it asked for something, when your, when your Caesar program actually asked for input from the user, it would already have it because you've piped in this file. And it's just another way, just a reverse of output, just input for your data. <coughs> and then the last one is pipe. So this one's pretty cool because it allows you to take the output of one program and, and put it as input to another program. So this might be, I don't know if any of you played with like the decipher um, that CS50 might have given you, but it would allow you to take some sample file, pipe it into your encryption, and then from there, pipe that into your decryption to make sure it turned out the same. Um, so it's kind of just this like three-way kind of uh, loop. It's just taking one program, sorry, go for it. <clears throat> If a program has multiple inputs, is there a way mm -hmm. to tell it which input to use the text file or the output for? It has multiple inputs. So <clears throat> whatever file you're, you're in, it will take the, when it's asking for input, that like first time it's going to assume, I think it's going to pipe in like the entire file. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have multiple inputs, you're going to be piping in multiple files. So like if you're asking for messages three times mm -hmm. in your code, you're going to be pi you're going to be like putting in three different files, and it gets crazy, and you shouldn't have to worry about that right now. But that's kind of the idea. Um, so yeah, pipe is just output one output of one program used as input into the other. Everyone good there? Cool. Okay. You probably won't have to do too much with it, but you should understand ways you can use this, and there are some cases that you might want to use it. So file I.O. Uh, so as I was just saying, we're used to reading from and writing to just like our screen there, which is <coughs> standard in and standard out. And that's what you guys have been doing since uh, the beginning of class here. But you can also read and write to files, which is all file I.O. is. So file input output, that's all it stands for. So this basically means that you can store your data now. When you just print it to the screen, it's basically gone, right? As soon as you run make hello world and run hello world, it prints hello world to the screen, but you can't really do anything with it from there. If you store it in a text file, then suddenly you have this data that you're allowed to manipulate or put into a file or put into a program later. So the only, one of the reasons why we do um, this is just as a way to store data for later use. <clears throat> okay, so I have a couple of steps here just walking through standard I.O. So step one, you need to create a reference to the file with uh, all caps, file, star, file. So that creates a pointer to a file. <clears throat> so then you want to open it. And you say, literally just file equals f open. And this is going to return a pointer to the file you've just opened. So I don't know if how many, I saw a couple of you guys at office hours, but one of the things is remember when we're trying to um, Pointers can be some address or null, right? If we ever have a case where something can return null, what do we have to do before we ever use it? You need to check if it's null or not, right? Because some of you may have had the issue where um, whatever object was being returned in breakout was null. You tried to perform some function on it, and your computer seg faulted, right? Bet a couple of you may have had that issue. So. With fopen, fopen will either return a pointer to the file, or if something goes wrong, it's going to return null. So you always need to check that it has not returned null before you attempt to do anything else. This is like a standard paradigm that you're going to need here. If there's ever a chance that something could return null, check to make sure it doesn't before you proceed. Otherwise, you're going to get lovely seg faults, and no one likes to deal with those. <coughs> so. As we see here, the first argument is just the path to the file. If that file doesn't exist, it's going to create that file and it's just going to be blank. 
Um, and then the second argument is the mode that you want. Do we want to read from this file? Do we want to write from it? Do we want to append? Um, so actually what I just said, if the file doesn't exist and you're trying to read from it, it's going to throw an error. If the file name, like if file.txt doesn't exist yet and you want to write to it, it will create a blank file called or file.txt for you. And if you want to append, you should do the same thing. Does that make sense? If you're trying to read from a file that doesn't exist yet, it'll throw an error. Otherwise, it will create the file for you to do what you want to it. Cool. So now we can read from the file. And this is just kind of going through um, the different functions that we have for file I.O. This will be necessary in PSET, this week's PSET, if I remember correctly. Yes, it absolutely will be necessary in this week's PSET. So f get c returns the next character. f get s just returns a line of text. So anything that has, it'll return anything up to a new line and it'll break. So f read reads a certain number of bytes and places them into an array, which is something you might want to do with resize. Might be useful. Um, how many people have read the PSET spec, by the way? OK. I have the body. Like the yeah. OK, all right. Definitely uh, read that. It's a fun piece that you get to decrypt, you get to recover a deleted like memory card. Really exciting when it worked. Um, but definitely start reading that. Come talk to me if you have questions about it. OK, so as I was saying, F read reads a certain number of bytes. So that could just be, that's some arbitrary number that you're going to set. <clears throat> and then fseek just moves to a certain position. So maybe you don't care about the next 10 bytes. You just want to skip ahead. You don't care about those. You want to read starting at like byte 11. fseek allows you to do that. So it allows you to be selective about what you're reading. Because f get c, f get s, and f read read from a certain place in the file. So a way to think about this is if this is our file. You have, when you first open it, you have like this like position in file that starts at the beginning, right? Whenever you call f get c, f get s, or f read, it's going to start from this position marker, OK? So let's say you just want to read this chunk of memory over here. You can't just call, you have to seek over here and then read from there, or read, get s, or get c, depending on what you want. So seek just allows you to skip portions of memory. And that's the only way you can skip things without reading them into your buffer. Does that make sense to everyone? OK. So <coughs> write, obviously, there's a lot of kind of parallel here. Is our output, our input redirection. We have read and write. So f put c just writes a character into the file. F put s writes a line. Um, F printf prints a formatted output. So if you have like tabs or space or whatnot. And then F write writes some array of bytes to a file. So this is the same way um, F write and F read are, you know, analogous opposites. F get s, F put s, and then F put c and F get c. Lots of crazy quick things. Um, just kind of keep this handy. Um, you'll have different times where maybe you just want some one character at a time. Maybe you want a whole line with your dictionary P set, which is in two P sets, I believe. Um, we give you a whole dictionary in a text format, which has every word separated by a line. So if you wanted to read in one word at a time, what might you use? If you're reading. And they're all separated on new lines, and you just want one word at a time. What might you use? Right, f get s, because that returns whatever is on one line. And if every word is its own line, we can use f get s. Cool. Does that make sense, everyone? Cool? Yeah, we're going to get to the fun part with like pointers very soon, where you get to do some math, and it'll be great. <coughs> so last step, close your file with so many things here, just as like one of our paradigms is if it can return null, check for null. If you open something, you better close it. Okay? So you're not done until you're done, unless you've closed it. 
kind of like, you know, it's not over till the fat lady sings, that's like closing your file. Um, <coughs> so as it says here, just to reiterate, always open your file before you're reading or writing to it, and always close it if you've opened it. All right? Cool. So here's an example. Uh, ah, so tiny. Um, example of writing to a file. I don't know if you guys can see that very well. Only we could increase the brightness somehow. Um, let me actually do this. Man. Ah. Okay, you guys can't really see that at all, can you? Okay, we're going to do this then. So it's not the coolest. Whatever. Okay. Let me format this really fast. I assume this is much better to see. Okay, anyone see where my mouse went is the question. Ah, there it is. I struggle. Okay, basically, you guys should have kind of an idea of what this is doing. Um, we have some, okay, it's not perfect, but I'd rather explain it than spend more time trying to format it properly. Um, <clears throat> basically, as you see here, we start with file open, and we have some database file that we are opening. It says it's our student, and we're going to write to it. So, of course, return null, so we have to check for null. And then if it's not null, we go through, and as you see, we're looping through here, through our students. Students is hard-coded or is hash-defined as three. And what we're doing is we are printing to the file, right? So what are we printing out to our file? The scores that are in the array? Yeah, the scores are in the array, exactly. So we are opening this database file, which I assume is some sort of grades database, and we're just printing out the scores of each student to that file. Cool? Good? Awesome. Okay. Let's get back to... Yeah, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Is the printf, like, that's not in the for loop, that's just in the if loop? No, or it's, is that just it's the in the for loop. It's okay, just... Okay. I was um, just I cannot see my mouse very well up here, yeah. so I'm struggling to format that properly. This bracket should be gone. It should be like down here. This is what's in your for loop. If I this.
now it's pretty. So that's how it should be. Except for that last bracket that I did here. Okay, does that make sense to everyone? Okay, we're gonna move on to the next thing then. Which actually, you're gonna need to see the code. So I'm just gonna copy that over right now. Okay, so I'm going to show you guys this code and I want you to try and figure out um, what it's supposed to do. Okay. So, given that, take a minute or so, try and figure out what's going on here. <coughs> Any ideas? So we know that we have at least two arguments with the command line, right? I assume one of which is going to be dot slash whatever our program is, and then something else, because if argc is less than two, we yell at them, right? And from the usage, it looks like it's going to be some sort of file. We all agree to that? <coughs> So now, what's the loop doing? What's it going through? Through all the files. Exactly. It's going through all the files that we've input there. So for each file, it's opening up some string there. It's opening up that file, right? And it's reading from it. Of course, checking if it's null. And then it's printing if it's null. It's just telling us that that's not a file that exists. Because remember, with read, our file has to exist, right? With write and append, we can get away with it. But with read, our file has to exist. And then if it does exist, what are we doing here? Let's just start here. What's this do? This first character from int to character, what does it do? Gets C gets one character, right? So what is this doing? It's getting the first character. You got anyone know E of F? In the file. In the file, exactly. So it's going to go through the entire file, right? And then it's going to update by getting every subsequent character, right? And what's it doing? Putting that in. So put char prints to your screen. Say that oh, it. So it's going to print the character. And then when it's done with that, it's going to close the file. Hmm? So you're not needing that else. Like not necessarily. Okay. I mean, it's it's kind of implied in this because this returns though. Um, as long as it doesn't catch this, you're fine. Um, I mean, it's probably good practice to do an else, but an else is not always necessary. <coughs> Especially if you have something like a return, which means that in this case, if it catches it, your program's going to end and it'll never get to this. It's more um, for the case where you have like more for the case where you're not necessarily returning something. Because if this wasn't returning anything, it would mean that if this were true, the rest of this would still run. And in that case, you would want a false. If it's returning and your program's ending, an else isn't necessary all the time. It depends on context. Jacob, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, so does f get c get the next character? Like, how, mm -hmm. do, how does the character like increase? Yeah, so f get c gets the next character. Yeah, so that's just, you can think of it as like c++ in a sense. Mm -hmm. So what was EOF? EOF is end of file. Oh. It's just a marker that lets you know you're at the end of your file. So this is going to print to your standard out, and then it's going to close the file when it's done, and then it's go to the next file, right? So 
So overall, what does this program do? Yeah. It just prints out everything there. So if you guys have ever used cat and then the name of some file, I don't know if any TF has ever done that on your terminal, but if you use um, the command cat, C-A-T, and then whatever file you have there, it just prints it out to your terminal, which can be super handy for some things. I use it a lot. Does that make sense to everyone? Cool. OK, so your task now, either by yourself or with the people around you, is to just write a simple program that will just write <clears throat> um, hello world out to a file. <laughs> All good. Four people who were here, I was like, did no one, did I do that badly last week? Like, I didn't think it was that bad. I'm glad you're all here. It really makes me happy. I am a girl of simple pleasures. I just like when my section is heavy. So yeah, I'm just getting this started for you guys so that we can code together. I don't like putting anyone on the spot. Unless we want to be. For the quiz, do we have to write a program? You may be asked to write simple programs by hand. Yep. The quiz is next week, right? Quiz is next Wednesday. Which means there's a lovely CSFT grade party afterwards, which means you'll get your scores back that night. <laughs> At what time? Who knows? But it will be that night. All right, how do we want to start this? Give you a hint, starts with this. We have to open a file. Yeah, so what do you want to call this? We just want to call it file. Let's make it easy. So F open. What do you want to call our, uh, what's our output test going to be? Call it hello. And what is our mode? What are we doing to this file? Just writing. We're writing to it. Lovely. OK, so we have this file now. What do we need to do? Check if it's null. Check if it's null, exactly. That's what I like to hear. That should be like automatic, especially like pretty much from this point on, if you think, if you start segfaulting, you probably didn't check for null somewhere. Like nine times out of 10, that's going to be your error. So if you could just get in the habit, always check if it's null, your life's going to be nice and easy or easier. So check to see if it's null. So if it's not null, which is what the bang equals means, if it's not null, it's valid, what do we want to do? <clears throat> we just want to print that file, right? So what are we going to use? F print F. F print F. Lovely. And fprintf takes two arguments, where it's going and what we want printed. So what's the first one? Where is it going? File. It's going to file. And what do we want printed? Hello world. Yeah. All right, we have one last thing. Another big paradigm here. Close. There you go. 
Is it happening if the file is null? No, this is if it's not null. Oh, if it's not null. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, for the F open and then the two arguments that go inside, mm -hmm. what does the first argument mean again? The argument is just like the name of the file that you want it to go to. So after this runs, you would have some file called hello that had hello world within it. That's all, just the name. Cool. And since it's writing, it doesn't, the file doesn't have to already exist. Is that what you said? Uh, right, exactly. Because we're writing, if hello as a file doesn't exist yet, it's going to create a file called hello and write to it for you. Yeah, when you're telling the program to like write to the file, mm -hmm. why do you write file instead of the name of the file in like fprintf? And, like, because um, in this case, we have that large like file all in caps star file. Mm -hmm. So it's a pointer to the file that you're talking about. Okay. This is the way that we just refer to it. So in this case, you can think of like um, file, haha, we can use this. File here refers to the opening of hello and letting it write. Could we import a hello instead, or no, instead of file? New, no, because hello needs to be like open and writable. Like file here yeah. is like a designator that says that, OK, we have this file hello that we're looking at. It has been opened, and we are going to write to it. If you just use hello, none of that is encapsulated in it. So it's going to freak out. <laughs> I mean, you could have named it. You could have done file star hello equals that. But the whole point is that you need a file star pointer in order to be able to use these functions. Yeah, could you do file star hello, <laughs> or do you have to put file star file? You could do file star hello. Yeah, you can, sorry, yeah, oh, sorry, yeah. You can change this yeah. to whatever name yeah, you want. It's, it's completely arbitrary what that name is. Yeah, you can name it anything. Um, name it Flying Spaghetti if you wanted. Yes? Uh, what is the W in quotes for? The W is just the mode, so we're writing ah, to this right. file. Okay. Everyone good? Clear? Yes? So when it writes this file, where do we then find that file? It will be in the same directory that you're like currently in. OK. So like in, if you're in like pset3 and you like run this, within your like pset3 folder is going to be this file called hello. Cool? Everyone good? I feel like you're all getting it, which is great. All right, so back to my slideshow. Yes. Oh, I love when things work. OK, pointers. You guys excited? Pointers are great. Um, they will take a little bit to wrap your head around. This is my second year teaching pointers, and I think I finally got it. So if you struggle, it's OK. As I said before, drawing pictures helps a lot with things in CS, as much as I think people tend to think, like, oh, we're at a computer. Like, we should just code. No. Drawing pictures will really help you. And I really encourage you to like tap into your kindergartner side and like bring out crayons or markers and draw. Because um, it will help you. And if you see me at office hours, I will be carrying around like stacks of paper with like pins drawing things out. So especially with pointers, draw pictures. And I'm sure we're actually going to be drawing some pictures here too. So you guys all got to see Binky, this cool like claymation thing. I always think it's really funny when he like explodes into a bunch of pieces. It's some comic relief for class. Um, so. <coughs> C allows us this great ability to be able to control memory. And it's one of the things that really makes it such a powerful language. Um, but with great power comes great responsibility. And crazy things can happen if you're not careful. So when you're using pointers, you want to make sure and really understand exactly what you're doing. So hopefully, the next you know, couple, little bit of time will help you really understand pointers, how to use them, and how to manipulate them. So memory. Uh, we've all, I'm sure we've, see, we've seen this diagram before. So this is just, you know, a simple diagram of how things might be stored in memory. So we basically have these huge arrays of one byte blocks, which is what we have here. Which is why it increments by one each time. This is in hex, realize. Um, <clears throat> so eight bit blocks, and every block is associated with some hexadecimal address. So if you ever see like the zero x, that's just notating that it's a hexadecimal address. You can assume this means some address in memory. We're talking about memory addresses whenever you see hexadecimal. Okay? So 
We have, you know, ints are variables, floats are variables, um, that's store. So ints store ints, floats store floats. So we also have pointers that store memory addresses. That's the sort of mapping. Pointers are exclusively for memory addresses, OK? So that's like your type there. Um, <coughs> your appliance is 32-bit, which means that your memory address is four bytes. So any pointer that you have is also going to be four bytes, regardless of if it's like four bytes. Memory is four bytes. Pointers store memory. Therefore, they're four bytes. Cool? I want to reinforce that. So you should get this comic now. I don't know how many of you are XKCD fans, but I love XKCD. It's great. All right, so creating pointers. As I said, pretty much just like anything else. You have a type, and you have a name. Right? Exactly what we have there. Type star, which means it's um, a pointer, <coughs> and then whatever you want to call it. So the type represents what you can store. All right? In the same way that if we do int x, we know we're storing an int there. OK? With a pointer, it holds a, ad it holds a memory address, but what it means is that Here's where drawing is going to come in handy. So in this case, we have some value, let's say 4. 4 is at address 1, OK? This first one here means that it's a pointer to x. Right? It's some pointer x. x may be something wherever. Whatever x is, say x is 4, it's going to store the memory address here. So in star x, this is some other slot in memory. Who knows what it is? But it's going to store an address here. So this would be like in this case. OK? We're going to get to how this goes in. But whatever is at, what it is saying is whatever is stored at 0x1, whatever is stored at the address, that our pointer holds has to match up with what we've designated. So at 0x1 in this case, if this is, this is x, this can only ever be a int while we're using this. Okay? Similarly, if we have another one y, whatever address is stored within y has to be a char. Same thing with z. Um, in the same way you can't, you know, assign, whenever you try and do like, you try to do int x equals 0.4, it's going to yell at you and be like, no, you said you wanted an int. Like, this is supposed to be an int. Stop trying to make it a float. So let things be what they want to be. Let things be themselves and see. Um, <clears throat> so big thing is just whatever type of pointer it is, that's the only thing you can store there. Okay? With practice. As with last week, everything seems really, you know, kind of abstract. We're going to do some practice. It should make more sense. So referencing and dereferencing. It's really important to get these straight. Um, I still have to, like, refresh every now and then. And I'm like, wait, which one do I want? So the ampersand will actually give you <coughs> um, is the reference or address of. So it returns the address in memory of which variable is stored. Okay, so it's going to actually return to you a hexadecimal. Whereas dereferencing it is actually going to give you the data that is stored there. Okay? So we're going to look at an example really fast. Or actually up next. Okay. So we have to think really carefully about this. So here we have some integer x. I'm going to try and draw this out to the best of my abilities. So we're going to have this slot x, right? And it's storing 5. Its address is 0x4. Cool? All good. So now we have this pointer, which is over here. And the ampersand, right, gives us the address of something. So in this case, it's the address of x. What is the address of x? Right. 0, 4. 
and this pointer is at 0x, 0h. Cool? So you can think about this pointer, 0, 4, just like points over here. So it's, like they're called pointers because as we get like more into this, you're going to see like pointing to things and like one block pointing to another block will make a lot of more sense. So here are two. And then we have some copy, which is what? 0x, zero 0c. Zero <clears throat> and it's going to dereference pointer. So what it's saying is, OK, here's our pointer. The value it stores is 0x04. Zero zero and what it's saying is, go to this address and tell me what's in it. Right? So that's effectively what this arrow is doing. You can think of this as like your star. So it says, OK, when we do star, it means follow, go to this address. So in this case, you can think of just like following this arrow to this memory chunk and give us what's in it, which is 5, which is why our copy is equal to 5. Does that make sense? Does anyone need me to go through that again or more slowly? You want me to go through it one more time? OK. So we're going to redraw it again. When we start, we all agree we have some chunk of memory. That's a variable x, right? that we set equal to 5. We don't control where it is in memory, so this spot is just arbitrarily assigned. Good there? OK. Then we initialize a pointer to an int, right? That's why it's allowed to point to x, because we have an int in here. We have another chunk of memory, because this pointer is a variable just like anything else. It's arbitrarily assigned some space in memory. And what it stores is the address of x. Ampersand means address of x. So what is the address of x? <coughs> it's 0x04. Zero, 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 zero. OK? So then, last one. We have some copy. Again, just another variable. So it's assigned some arbitrary place. OK? And we dereference our pointer. The star means go to the address stored in my pointer. Tell me what's there. So the address stored in our pointer is 0x04. Zero zero so we go to that address. It's pointing to that address. What's inside this memory block? It's a 5. So that's what we assign to copy. Everyone good? Cool. Again. Pictures. Oh. Why did it do that? Did that because RJ messaged me. OK. So tracking the values here. I'll let you guys think about this. Or you can, we can draw another picture. But I want you to kind of try and reason through this on your own for a minute. <clears throat> Since they didn't give us an example address, I'm just going to do ampersand x, which should help drive it home. Ampersand means address. OK, so in the first one, everyone go with the first line. Some x that's 5, right? Some random slot in memory. OK, int star pointer is equal to the address of x, right? Int star pointer creates this block, right? Calls it pointer, and it assigns it to the address of x. I am terrible at ampersands. OK, now what we're doing is we say, OK, dereference our pointer. So we go, OK, what's in our pointer? It's ampersand x. Go to ampersand x and reassign it. OK, so now ampersand x is going to be 35. So basically, when you're dereferencing, you go, OK, you're going to be drawing pictures like this. You're going to be drawing your arrows over where it is. 
So go to this slot in memory and either like give me that value back or alter it. Okay? In this case, because we have, we're at this value, we're assigning it to be 35. Whereas in the last one, if you noticed, we were assigning what was in here to something else. Okay? So we have this awesome table. Not that bad. You guys work on it. I'm going to draw it out on the board. We're going to fill it out together, okay? So grab some paper, grab a partner, start working. <clears throat> I'm going to get a bigger piece of chalk because it's going to be a lot. Okay. Okay, let's start with the first row. We'll start there, then you guys can maybe work through some more. Okay, A equals B times C. So what is A? It's not a trick question, I promise. Four times five. Four times five, 20. So what's B? Four. And C? Five. five. And then this is just gonna be ampersand A, ampersand B, ampersand C. Right? Not bad. It's simple enough. Okay, so the next one. A equals A times C. In case anyone was unfamiliar with that. Is everyone familiar with the times equals? Okay, all this means, this is shorthand. Shorthand for A equals A times C. You can also do it with division, with addition, with subtraction. You can do A equals or A plus equals C means A equals A plus C. A minus equals C would be A equals A minus C. It's just syntactic sugar. <coughs> so in this case, A is equal to A times C would give us what? Again, not a trick question. 100. 100. Does anything else change? Maybe I will finally get better at like my ampersands. Right, we'll sorry, how'd you get 100? Okay, so A is equal to A times C. So A times C. Oh, you're using A from the previous. Yes, uh, so right, right. these are our most recent values. These are what you should be using as we okay. move down, okay? <laughs> so B is the only thing changing, right? So let's fill in everything else.
B. What is B going to be? To be or not to be? So what is this doing? What is the star PA doing? Go to the location of PA? No, not quite. So this is a dereference. So B is handed value of PA? <laughs> yeah. So PA is what the address is A, right? So it's saying go to where A is stored, and give it that. right? And give it that value. So what is B? 100. 100. Perfect. OK. So PC is what's changing. Everything else stays the same. What is PC going to be? Simple assignment. PC is equal to PA. And what is PA? Ampersand A. Perfect. Now we're getting interesting, right? Okay. Let's break this one down. First, what's PC? B, C, B times C. Because that's the easy part of this one, right? B yeah. times C is? 500. Okay. Yeah. So, <coughs> so, what is this one doing? If it's star BB, what's changing? What's in the what's in what's B? in the space that PB is pointing to? And PB is pointing to B. B. So the only thing changing is B, right? So B times C, five hundred. So that's what changes now. Cool. Lovely. You guys are doing great. All right. Breaking this one down. C is changing, right? So we can fill in everything else. Let's see. Okay. We know that C is going to be the product of two numbers, right? What two numbers, though? <coughs> A and C. So A is right for the first one. So we're dereferencing P of A, right? P of A points to A. So we know that this is going to be uh, 100 times what? Times what does C, P, C point to? A. Points to A. So 100 times 100 is 10,000. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Home stretch, guys, last row. Okay, what's changing here? A, perfect. So everything else can stay the same. Okay, and what is A? So it's A times what? This is star PB. So star PB means here's PB. PB points to B. 500, so we have 500 times 100, it's 50,000. Look at that. See? Nothing. Why do we have the and C for the last? Sorry. Oh, okay. My bad. Lots of writing. Everyone good? Not too bad, right? Just takes a little while to work through. If you break it down, understand what each part is referring to. As with everything is yes, break it down into the little problems and then recombine and you can do some awesome stuff. So there are the answers, but we did that. Pointer arithmetic. So, ah, my hands are all chalky. So adding or subtracting in adjusts the pointer by the um, size of the type of pointer. Remember how every um, type has a different size, right? So like a double or a long long is eight. An int is four, a char is one. So what you want to do is, <clears throat> one thing to remember is just that how much your pointer value actually changes will depend on the type of pointer it is. So if we had some, everyone good with this? Can I erase it? We're good? Awesome. So if we have some pointer that 
This is going to be, I'm going to make it an indicator. Stores this. If you were to say pointer plus one, what it's going to do is it's going to update it by the size of an int because that's the type of pointer it is. Let's see, everything is very strict and regulated, okay? It's an int pointer, it's going to update by the amount of space an int would take. An int is four bytes, right? So what would this turn into? You're just like adding four onto this. So now your pointer would be, okay? So if it was a char, and we did pointer plus one, what would it be now? If it started, pretend we've started, right now it's 0x08. Let's now say that this was a char pointer. And we added one, what would it change to? How many bytes is a char? One. So it would be nine. Okay, so just something to remember. Just when you add one, it's not adding one unless it's a char. Um, it's adding how, much, how many bytes the type that it is, okay? Which is why we have this um, equation up here. So it's n times size of the type of pointer, okay? So we have kind of the example here. Um, <clears throat> y was assigned to that value, 0x4 when we did y plus equals one. What's in it, what's in x doesn't change. What does change is what's in y. The address stored in y updated by four because there are four bytes in an int. So it's an int pointer. All right, so now we have another exercise. So question is, what will print? Yes. The number of characters in parentheses. Exactly. Just the length of your string. Does everyone get that? Do we want to walk through it? Yes? Okay. So, what we have here, I like this so much more. I don't have to like read ridiculously. So, we have our string here, right? Happy cat. Lovely. We have some counter that we're keeping track of. So, we have some char star pointer that just is set equal to str. What this is doing is it's assigning some pointer to the beginning of your string. Because I'm sure, as it was mentioned in lecture, we've given you guys this data type called string, but really strings are just um, an array of characters, like it's a char star, it's a pointer to a bunch of characters that are contiguous in memory, right? So this just sets it equal to any string is identified by where its first character is. So this is just setting some pointer equal to the beginning of the string. Everyone good there? Cool. So this is dereferencing our pointer, right? So it's actually going to give us some value in here, in our string that we're talking about. And we're saying as long as it's not the null terminator, right? So keep going until you get to the end of the string. Update your pointer by one. So our, it will actually update by one each time because this is a char, right? A char star. So it's going to go through, it's going to update. So the first time this runs, it's going to be here at H. It's going to update. It'll be at A, it'll be at P, Y, so on and so forth. It'll update counter. When it reaches the end, it just prints how far it's gotten. Yes? So it, it counts the space as one, right? OK. Makes sense. Is that a question? No, okay. play in my head. No worries. <coughs> I do that. <laughs> All right. So one thing to understand is that like with an array, you can also treat it as a pointer because arrays are just continuous spots in memory, right? So you can treat it the same way. Uh, you can you can manipulate them with pointers too. So instead of doing <coughs> in this case. The analogous thing would be array 
zero equals one, right? But in the same way that a string is just is determined by the start of its where its first character is, an array is determined by where its first element is. Because we know we're guaranteed that these are going to be continuous blocks of memory, right? That's what allows us to do this. We know they're continuous blocks of memory. So in this case, by dereferencing just array, that tells us, OK, go to the start of your array, which is here. So we can set it equal to 1. And in this case, whatever your array, whatever your array type is, when you update it by 1, that's just like updating it to the next index. Okay? That's, you can do that because you know what's in your array. So it knows how much to update your pointer by, what address to update it to, so that you're at the next slot. Okay, so this is just a different way of writing array 0 equals 1, array 1 equals 2, array bracket 3, equal, or array bracket 2 equals 3. Just another way to think about it. Because they are continuous blocks in memory, you can refer to them either by the array notation, which I personally find easier, but maybe you need to manipulate it strictly by memory addresses, and this is the way you would do that. Kind of more of like a cool thing you can do versus maybe not something you're actually going to implement. This is <laughs> I use it in 61. You guys probably don't need to worry about it too much. But if you're interested, take 61 next year. OK, we're in the home stretch, guys. I know, it's long. OK, dynamic, dynamic memory allocation. Um, so <laughs> we know that. Uh, one of the things when we talked during our first section together, we looked at a swap function, right? Where it was outside the scope of our main function, and <coughs> we were passing in these values that were effectively copies. And once swap finished executing, it just left the stack. Remember, we have a stack frame for swap. It leaves, and those values leave with it, and they were gone. We couldn't do anything with them, and we were sad because we can't swap our values. But with C, as I mentioned, you have a lot of power over memory. So what you can do is you can allocate things on the heap here that will stay there until you tell them otherwise. They're like good children. They stay there. They don't leave. They will stay there until you're like, OK, you can go away, whereas things on the stack who knows? They're like naughty children. They'll just run away when you want them to be there, and they're gone, and you don't know how. You can't get them back. Okay, so the heap is. We're going to talk about um, malloc and freeing, which I'm sure you guys heard about in lecture, um, and that's basically a way to have very persistent data. So you can keep the data around as long as you want. So. Mm -hmm. When you define heap and stack, are they like places to put things? <coughs> So they're basically just um, they're the way we refer just to memory. So heap is just places where memory is um, you, it's allocated dynamically, um, whereas stack refers more to like stack frames that um, <clears throat> are more central to the functions that are actually running. You don't really have control. The big difference, you have control over the heap if you want to. You have less control over the stack. Stack depends on the functions that are running and the order in which they are run and how things are returned. Whereas with a heap, as we'll see, you can say, OK, I want this value to be around until I tell you otherwise. You are not allowed to get rid of it. You're not allowed to override it. You're going to keep it around for as long as I tell you. You get to be the boss in the heap. Whereas a stack, maybe if you like finagle your way, you can be the boss, but not quite. And it's, it's really just memory. It's just different ways of referring to memory. Cool. So with that, how to control your memory with malloc, which you're going to get to use. So <coughs> it's just short for memory allocation. That's all it is. Um, there's a bunch of other cool functions that have like alloc at the end, and they stand for different things. Um, so when you need storage that needs to outlast your current function, so that when your current function runs away, you still have the data that you um, got from it, you want to use malloc. That'll initialize it on the heap. And like I said, we keep saying, you'll keep it there until you tell it otherwise, which is the important thing here. So 
One thing to notice, and that's typically really important, is that this size of is super useful to use because depending on the type of machine you're running, an int may have varying um, amounts of memory that it takes. So you always want to use size of so that you're not machine dependent, so that you can use it on your code will run on any machine. And that's just part of writing good code, right? If it works on one machine but not on any others, how useful was your program? So you always want to make sure and use size of. So is that like size of 10 inches by doing that? So this, is, this is the size of 10 inches. Okay. Yeah. So size of int will return how much does one int take, or size of char, how much does one char take, and then how many blocks of that do you want? So in this case, we would want something that we can store 10 ints to, and it will work regardless of machine, which is cool. <coughs> so how many bytes would that actually give you? Quick math. 40. 40, exactly. So another big thing, pointer or malloc can return null. So again, always check to see if it returned null before you try and do anything with it. Um, if <coughs> if uh, you try and dereference this pointer now, it's just going to seg fault because you went and tried to touch null when you shouldn't have. So always check for null again. That's all you can do. Um, <coughs> it might return null. It'll return null if you're either out of space or for whatever reason it ran to some memory bug. Um, it sometimes just returns null. So you just have to check for it. That's all, all this slide is saying. And then what we have here is a call to free. So in the same way that if you open a file, you must close a file. If you malloc memory, you must free that memory. And you guys will get to do really cool stuff. And there's like a program you can run to see if you're ever leaking memory. But you don't want to leak memory. It's really bad. Um, just mess up things. It's bad to do uh, just like programming wise, like for design and efficiency. But it's also just like kind of bad for your computer. So just free things when you <laughs> malloc them. You guys see the symmetries here. Uh, Super simple, just free, and then whatever your pointer is, whatever the name of your pointer is, and it will take care of freeing it for you. Cool. Then we have this. So we're just going to walk through this program, and then you guys are done. So of course, just, just main. So we have some int star pointer. So we have a pointer that's going to hold ints, right? And how many ints is it going to hold? Just one, right? That's an int. We check to see if pointer is null, because if it is, we want to say, don't do anything. It's bad. So we print some error out of memory most often. It returns one, as you guys are used to. And then we have here, we dereference our pointer, right? So that means we're going to store something at the location given to us, right? Inst our pointer, or malloc, returns the address of where it set aside this memory for you, OK? So it's basically giving you, like, if you think about a bunch of houses in a neighborhood, right, that you want to put your furniture in, malloc is like, OK, you get to go to house three. And it gives you the address of house three. So this right now, this pointer, stores an address, stores the address of your house. Star pointer means, OK, I'm at my house. Cool. I need to get some integer. So you're asking for someone to give you furniture now. So you get some int, and it puts it in your pointer, where it's pointing to. And then it just prints out, you entered wherever. And again, dereference. So this is like you went to this address, and you saw what was there. Cool. And then, of course, we free our pointer. Don't forget to free your pointer. Don't forget to check for null. Don't forget to free your pointer. It's two things you remember from this. I thought you should remember. Yes. And stuff like that, like, like char stars. How can we never free those? Hmm? Are those just like strings? You said strings are just like char stars, mm -hmm. right? So why don't we free strings? You only need to free if you're mallocking. Oh, if you're mallocking. So okay. malloc and free are two things that you should okay. always have together. F open, F close, two things you should have together. Okay. In both those cases, check for null. Okay. Yes. So free is just <laughs> allowing something else to be stored there after this program is used? It's just saying, OK, I'm done with this. You don't need to keep it around. 
Otherwise, your computer will just like try and keep it there, and then you can't, it like runs into memory issues later. You always want to free it because it tells your computer, okay, I'm done with this spot of memory. You can have it back for me to use later. Cool. Yes. So we um, we use the percent D just because that a double that's coming back, or it why is. is K percent I. Yeah. K percent I. Okay. Any last minute questions? Good. I just have mm -hmm. a quick question. So the like the PTR variable mm -hmm. that's like with the int star PTR equals malloc. Mm -hmm. That's just saying like it's pointing to a like a place in memory that's the size it? of. No, it's okay. okay. But it's just like pointing to a place in memory that's just this just like four bytes. Right. Okay. It's just giving you so malloc size of int. That's okay. I'm gonna go run off find four bytes of memory for you. When it finds that four bytes of memory, it gives you back the address of where it starts. And that's what's stored in pointer, or PTR. Good? You guys look less confused than most people when I talk about pointers, so I'm feeling pretty good right now. All right, um, as always, you guys should have all gotten your piece at two grades by now. I know there have been some wonky things where it says like, formula not valid or something, if you're getting that, all of your grades are valid on my side, so I can send you screenshots of your grades. Um, just let me know, as well if you're missing any grades or something doesn't seem to make sense, come to me. Um, I've been super proud of you guys already, so keep it up. And have a good rest of your week. I'm sure I'll see some of you at office hours. <laughs>